Good afternoon to those of you watching us live on Facebook. We're coming to you from CGH Medical Center again. I think this is week eight of doing this. I'm Dr. Bill Bird. I'll be called Bill for the rest of this pot, for the rest of this Facebook Live conversation. I'm this uh, chief medical officer here at CGH Medical Center, and I'm really excited to have a couple uh, medical staff as guests today uh, talking with me. So, uh, first guest we're going to have today here is Dr. Eric Coons, and Dr. Coons is the chair of Department of Medicine. That's correct. Yeah, so that's kind of like the uh, medical problem kind of things that you would have when you show up and get cared, uh, cared for here at CGH. And after Dr. Coons and I have a conversation, uh, Dr. Eric Riley, who's the chair of the Department of Surgery, is going to chat with me as well. And he uh, handles all things that are surgical. So I think you're going to in for a treat this afternoon just to get some more information about what's going on here at CGH. And just as, uh, we'll see how it goes. I'm gonna to try to answer as many of your questions as I can. Uh, I will say though that um, um, I think we're gonna have some pretty good back and forth with Dr. Coons and Dr. Riley, because um, there's I think a lot of questions that you might be wanting to know about that I'm gonna be asking them already. So be patient, if you will, as, as we kind of go through this and we'll get as many of your questions in as we can. So Dr. Coons, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm impressed by our new uh, bit of technology here. I feel like I should be uh, announcing best actor on the, uh, on the Emmys. Yeah, I know. Uh, definitely we're, we're up in the game here uh, in terms of the equipment, that's for sure. Okay, so what I, I wanted to do to start with, with, with Dr. Coons with you is just to kind of talk through a little bit about how things are at the clinics as we've kind of begun opening up and so I, I think my first question I have for you is how is the ra the ramping up process of seeing in our patients how's that going uh, well first and foremost we have to be very careful whatever we do and we have to get back to doing some of the things that we need to do we can't put these things off forever but first and foremost we have to be careful about how we do that and the time that we had with bending the curve and shutting things down was very very useful and taking a good hard look at at what everything looks like in the clinic and everything we do in the clinic and how does COVID affect that and, uh, and, and play a role. So um, in order to be careful, part of that is being a little slower in spacing out appointments until we make sure we have the process dialed in. So um, I would like it to be even faster. You know, we're, we're all, we got into this to see patients. So, you know, we would yeah. all like to do that as fast as possible. Um, but it is definitely coming, and I think it's coming faster than um, than was expected as far as starting at 25%. We're clearly ahead of that, and we're doing that safely. We're leveraging telehealth and those sort of things well. So um, I think it is coming along. I've been impressed that patients have been very understanding and patient because it's not always easy. I mean, there are people that... that uh, everyone likes to be seen right away and we like to accommodate them as, as best as we can uh, but things are, are definitely moving along and I think we're getting comfortable with handling who can be seen by telehealth who needs to come sure. in um, who is yeah. higher risk and lower risk and so, how to manage. So like walk us through for from the moment the patient shows up to the to an office what what kind of steps are in place to keep them safe? Okay uh, well, we'll start at the front door. There, you're going to be screened for temperature and questions about if you have symptoms related to COVID. Um, and if you do, that doesn't mean we just tell you to go home. We, we, we have ways to manage that and, and deal with that, but that usually means you probably won't be um, in with your regular doctor that day. You may be directed to ready care where they can uh, make sure that there's no COVID related issues so that we, we make sure part of the safety issue again is making sure we keep people with uh, suspected COVID uh, apart as much as we can from people who, um, who are coming in for other reasons. Um, so you'll be screened that way. If you normally come in with a spouse, we normally love that, but we're gonna, we're gonna ask that spouse to, to um, wait outside or wait in the car. We can certainly communicate by a phone call if we need to afterwards or um, 
if there is a special need, you know, there is a, a problem with speech or something that there is a caregiver that's absolutely needed, we'll make an exception. This isn't rigid, but it, it is something that's important to pay attention to. So that's the front door. Um, then after you go through the, your line and get screened and your temperature checked. And then the, also the mask side of things. Right, right, yes. So yes, even before you come in, <laughs> um, you should have your, your mask in place. Um, we will also have you hand sanitize when you come in um, because you know before you come in the building we want that you to be as, as low risk as possible and that's part of that so yes you'll be uh, if you do not already have your own mask um, you will get a mask at that point um, you know for the for the protection of our workers up front we prefer you come in with a mask but sometimes that's not possible or there's an issue and we'll make sure you provide one um, then then you'll go upstairs um, and correct me if I'm wrong but I believe that that, that uh, nobody's checking in downstairs separately they're all going straight upstairs at, at this point um, that's um, so to have one less bit of contact then when you go upstairs um, as much as is possible we'd like to get you directly back into a room your own room that's been cleaned it's your own private space that means you may spend more time in an area that's um, uh, that's closed you off the, you don't get to hang out in our wonderful lobbies yeah well, <laughs> the, the social aspect is a little diminished here but it uh, but it's definitely safer speaking of things that are, that are different that way you know all the magazines and those sort of things are um, are, are taken away because they're things that COVID could rest on and the the mantra is everything that's out or in a place where a patient could be has to be able to be cleaned so that means that when you go into the room you'd normally see paper there that paper looks nice and neat but it can't be scrubbed down and cleaned where the the vinyl can be um, so I mean if you've ever tried to wash paper it doesn't work out well so things that, that are paper had to be taken out of the room um, things that were on the countertop are no longer on the countertop because those are all things we want put away. Um, so everything will be cleaned. You will have your own little sanctuary there, and it will be clean. Um, so like, yeah, it's so like from when one patient's in one of your exam rooms to when the next patient gets into one of your exam rooms, what takes place? Um, boy, the 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 room is cleaned by the nurse all horizontal surfaces are, are scrubbed with a bleach wipe um, anything else that that may have been touched by the doctor or patient uh, um, in that encounter will also be wiped down things like blood pressure cuffs things you don't normally think of that we we move from one patient to the next these are all the things that we had to go through this step by step and yeah. say can it go away or can we manage it yeah. and so there's a lot of thought put into that um, so there's a, a lot of detailed cleaning that goes on um, in there. Yeah, I think we've gone away from even clipboards. We, you know, if you yep. have paperwork, you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so uh, we've also taken a good look at the processes of things we call fomites, things that, uh, that COVID can hang out on and are, are passed from person to person. So the clipboards that we had before, um, if, if they're around at all, they're plastic and they've been wiped down. Otherwise, we have tag board that's disposable. Um, just things like paper notes, we're trying to minimize those at all that are, that are passed around. So we're trying to do more electronically. Um, yeah. So everything we can do to take a, another few steps down that road of making safety yeah. the best it can be. Can you kind of, kind of tell, walk through for the folks who are listening uh, and, and me, how do you decide who you're going to give a call and say, hey, you know what, I, I think I'd like to have you come back and, and I'd like to see you here in the office? Who are, who are those folks that you're deciding on? Yeah. Oh, first let me say that I've been somewhat surprised about what we can do in health, telehealth. The first sure. thing was, well, geez, we can't examine the patient. Well, you, you can ask them to do things and move and look at sores and rashes. And, so for um, folks who may not be aware of that, tell me, talk a little bit about the different options for them to be evaluated by you. Right, okay. So um, the the traditional option that we all know is that you come in and okay. um, and you see the doctor. And, and getting to your question that way, there are things, you know, if you have abdominal pain or things that, that really require a hands-on evaluation, or from time to time, you know, we really just need to see you in person, 
um, we'll ask you to come into the office. But if we're doing that, we've thought through that we think in this case, the benefits of that outweigh the risks of going out of the house. Because in general, we'd, we'd like to uh, like to keep yeah. you at home. Um, so if you're being asked to come in, usually there's a specific reason. Um, injuries are often an issue if we think we have to do something. Sometimes there's some regulatory issues as well. But I'm happy to see that a lot of that red tape has gone away. Um, so there are a lot of things that um, just required an in-person visit just because that are that aren't anymore. So some of that some of that is better. Um, the getting back to the telehealth, um, the that's the next option where you can. Um, you can call in and ask for a telehealth visit. A nurse will then contact you, and just like she sits down in the room before the visit, she'll go through all the questions and ask if you have your home blood pressure or other things that we can evaluate um, and, and record all those things. And once she's done with that, she will then electronically send a link to us, and we'll click on that, and you'll appear on our screen, and your phone will appear on, uh, your, your phone will have us uh, on that so we can actually visually interact and talk. Um, sometimes that's not possible. There are connection issues, there are people without smartphones, so we can do more by telephone. Obviously that's one step more limited, um, but it is something that we can that we can still get stuff done and what we call triage. Sometimes we'll call you and see you and we'll say, boy, you know, based on everything I'm seeing, I really do need to see you. Um, and sometimes that, that's still a thing, but at least we can start with what would be the safest option. Sure. Kind of, as you're talking, it kind of is like, this has been really bad, this whole pandemic thing and for, and for our, the whole society, yeah. no question about it. Um, and yet in some ways, this necessity has been the mother of, in, in, if not invention, then at least willingness to, to take on things that we knew could be options for patients. Right. It's really made us take a very good hard look at optimizing everything to do with infection. And this will play out in some benefits when it comes flu season again. Um, and so, so there, there's a lot of things that as much as you try and do everything well all the time, when something gets brought to the forefront and you really do the deep dive, you can make it better. So there's a lot of things that have been made better for all sorts of things through this process. It's been a bit of a painful process, yeah. but it, yeah. uh, it, at least it's resulted in some, some yeah. real benefit. So, so um, I'm going to go by Eric here too, because we're, you know, Bill and Eric, we're used to that with each other. I'm just so we're more comfortable as we're talking. So Eric, if, if, um, if you had to come in for an appointment, would you feel comfortable right now that it's a safe environment to come in and get taken care of by you if the patient well, needs to be seen? I may be a little bit prejudiced here, but uh, absolutely. In speaking in, in, all, in all honesty, um, I would bring my family members in. I would bring my mother in who, who's elderly if there's something that requires that. I think as much as I worry about anything in the clinic, I worry about people you know, going out and about in general. So if I'm going to ask them to come out and about in general, then there needs to be a good reason. But there are times that that, that is necessary, and there are times that we can get by with things that don't entail um, any you know, much of any risk at all. And you know, there are some. Speaking of the interesting benefits, you know, when I did some telehealth visits, um, there were some elderly people that I saw some stuff on the floor that were tripping hazards and stuff that I wouldn't have picked up yeah. if they came into the yeah. office. Yeah. So. Um, there, there is, there is definitely that, and you get a little bit of a sense for, um, for how everything, yeah. uh, is at home. You know, I, um, I read something today. Speaking of like the safety issue, um, and you know, here versus going to um, a grocery store, and they did uh, antibody testing on folks. I think it was in like New York City or something like that, and actually, healthcare workers had a lower antibody. Um, they were fewer than were positive for antibodies than the general population, and the thinking was is that in healthcare environments we're doing a, a pretty doggone good job of infection control and prevention measures, and out in the general public, folks aren't either as aware or as willing or you know as motivated to follow those. Yeah, I, I think there's likely a lot of truth to that. We are a little paranoid 
by nature, uh, and then you add in this, and <laughs> we are we are becoming very, very, very careful. A little paranoid by nature, right? Not, yeah. not too much. Yes, and and in, in, in these things, um, in my background, I used to love to race, and there was there there was a joke that we felt safer in our in our race cars with all the safety equipment than than driving the rig and the trailer there with all the crazy people on the yeah, street. Yeah. And uh, to some extent, that that uh, that plays out here too. This is an, an environment that everybody's paying attention, and it there are systems in place to make sure we're cleaning uh, between every patient. So um, I think this is a very safe place. The risk is generally from going out more than it is from coming here right yeah. now. Yeah. Now, again, part of the reason we ask people not to come in is to make sure we have the time to do this right. And that, that took a lot of time and effort to make sure that we had thought through sure. all of those things. Yeah, good. So what I want to, I want to pivot a little bit here with you because uh, Eric is also leading up our team in terms of uh, patients that are admitted to the hospital and have COVID and how we go about, you know, doing the best we possibly can to take care of them. It's, we call it our clinic, uh, cl uh, COVID clinical guidance team. Guidance team yeah. yeah. I could, those are, there's some of the initials CCG there. team. There we go. Yeah, yeah. There we go. All right. So, hey, how about just kind of, kind of give us a nutshell of some things that we've, that you've learned that the team's learned as we've taken care of these patients. Right. Well, we, we made this team because we knew that this was going to be such a rapidly evolving area and something that is very challenging for any single doc to keep up on um, at a level that, that we expect uh, around here. So we wanted to make sure that we had a group of doctors, a little bit like we used to do and still do with cancer case review, where complex things, we bring in all the physicians and we talk this through. So we brought in a team, I mean, this, this was cardiologists, this was infectious disease doctors, this was pharmacists, everybody who was a part of that circle, we would get together in the beginning every single day, because it was a bit of drinking through the fire hose, you know, uh, does, you know, how can we use new drugs that we're not sure about, how can we use them safely, how can we evaluate them. Um, I mean, sure, you know, there's been a lot made about hydroxychloroquine and remdesivir and all those in the convalescent plasma. So that's, a, that's a, been a very actively managed day by day uh, by this team. And so in the beginning, when the hydroxychloroquine was something that we were hopeful for, yeah. um, and we wanted to use it in some select patients, we also knew that it had some risk. Yeah. So we had to develop protocols of monitoring, how do we monitor their EKG to make sure we keep them safe? Because we really can't justify taking very much risk for a therapy that's unproven, but it's hopeful. Yeah. So we had to be so careful about that. And there were patients that we started on it, we started to see, um, some things that were concerning on the EKG and we had to stop it before it became a problem but we put those processes in place to make sure yeah. that people stayed safe. Um, at this point it looks like hydroxychloroquine at least as we understood it before is not ready for prime time yeah. so there's still some studies ongoing for maybe specific doses or specific times yeah. and we'll keep an eye, our eye on those but um, as we were hoping to use it originally it's not working out so, so we had to sure. back off on that. Um, the, if, I remember, if I remember right early on too, and now we have it in place, you have like a, I guess you'd almost say like a, a plan, a power plan is what we call it, mm -hmm. for patients who get admitted who we have suspicion of COVID that we kind of have a checklist of things that we do. Right. So there were members of the team that went out on all sorts of different um, uh sites that have good reputable information major hospitals what what's their protocol and we looked at all these protocols and we also found ways to get them in real-time format because you can't look in a textbook for right. this stuff so right. um when we put those all together and made our own order set um which made it so we don't miss things you know we sure. we have a, a process by which this goes and in the beginning we were changing that order set every day or two tweaking yeah. it a little bit um, that's finally slowed down, but it's still not. Yeah. It's still not done yet. So yeah, and I want, and I know we're uh, on some time stuff, but can you tell me, like, for the folks who are listening, you know, what are some of the things that they may have read about that we have actually we're actually using here at the hospital for patients? Right. Well, this is exciting. I mean, because we got on this uh, early and carefully, we're already doing some things that that may seem uh, like they would otherwise be done. 
and, and research hospitals. And indeed, the, the, the one that stick, comes to mind uh, very much is the convalescent plasma. So you may have heard convalescent plasma is something like a blood donation from someone who has had COVID. You separate out the antibodies from that, what they've made to fight their own virus, and you give this to another patient. This has been used in other diseases very, uh, very effectively. Um, and it, it looks very promising with, uh, with COVID as well. In fact, there's a fair amount of good data that it's at least somewhat helpful. Mm -hmm. Exactly how helpful, we'll keep looking at over time. But uh, we partnered with the Mayo Clinic. We got uh, on board with their protocol. Um, we register with the Mayo Clinic. And we're also, not only are we, are we now giving this to patients, which this has already happened here in our hospital um, with some early exciting results. Obviously, we can't talk about specifics, Correct. but yeah. it, it's very exciting to be a part it of is. that. It is. And not only the treatment part, but we're also part of the research part. When yeah. those patients get that, we check yeah. back in with the Mayo Clinic and say, here's how the patient did. This is how science works well, sure. and we're a part of that sure. here. How about the prone positioning? Yeah, so um, there's... Uh, there's an interesting phenomenon with COVID that um, laying on your stomach seems to improve the oxygen levels. Uh, it's very complicated why that is, but what, we're, what we found is originally this was for people with ventilators that were, this was sometimes done, but um, as we've gone on, we've seen this be effective for people who are, um, who are not on ventilators. Um, who are able to flip themselves over on their own. They're earlier in the process, but it's still very useful. Yeah. So we've, we've had to develop, you know, educate our nursing team about how to do that, how to encourage that, and we have patients that have responded to that well as well. And, you know, hopefully these are the sort of things you talk about, boy, there, you know, nationally there's not as many ventilators as we thought we would need. That's in part because we're learning how to keep people off of ventilators better. Yeah. So that's really exciting to see some of that happening here as well. Yeah. And um, it's one thing I love about being in a community hospital is we can be very nimble. You know, we can have a, a, yeah. a, a group of docs uh, get together, make decisions, um, and implement things very quickly. I mean, we have our IT people. There, there's no levels of bureaucracy. I mean, I'm. I, yeah, there you go. I I'm, like to hear that. <laughs> I'm, I mean, when, when we have uh, uh, our IT person on the phone, and before we're done with the meeting, she says, I got the power plan updated. Take a look at it. Is it good? And they're like, yep, that's good. Yeah. And then it's yeah. things are able to happen real time. It's really exciting. Yeah. And, you know, as much as this is very difficult to see uh, you know, the whole problem is very very difficult as a doctor it's it's also good to see that that uh, the type of response that this brings out in the hospital and how we can yeah. actively manage that here yeah yeah good hey I what, what we're talking about this uh, convalescent plasma process is uh, the the letters are CCP if you kind of uh, google those anyhow on our on our Facebook page and on our website there are opportunities to donate. If you've, uh, if you've been positive for COVID or you know someone who has been, there are certain criteria you have to meet uh, that you could, we could find when you look on this on our website or Facebook page. But yeah, we would encourage folks, if you're a candidate, to go ahead and, and put your hat in the ring uh, that you're uh, willing to donate uh, for that. So I just want to give an opportunity for those of us who are listening to, to definitely be aware of that because we're using it here in our community hospital and other community hospitals across the country to try to help patients out. So, yeah, they talk about buying local. We want to save local, <laughs> right? Yes, um, we do. Yes, so we do. everybody right. who gets CCP here had somebody donate it. It's not something that we can synthesize yet, so we need your help. So thank you very much. Yeah, but, um, I want to just I just want to make sure if there's some questions that um, I that we've had here that if we make sure I give you an opportunity to answer those. Um, comment on my bow tie. Thank you. It's bow tie Thursday. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Uh, let's see here. How is getting labs done going to work? So uh, the same screening process at the door and masking and asking questions and all that happens if you're in the building for any reason, including labs. Yep. So we try and keep people safe that way. You know, the, the lab is also very careful about cleaning. So all those same processes apply to labs. And you're in and out. spacing set up uh, in, in like the lab and outside in actually our atrium, we have spacing for that too. Right. Yeah. And you're in and out pretty quickly. 
you know, so yeah, I think yeah. that's okay. How much is a telehealth visit versus a regular office visit? My understanding is that I, I think we aim to provide the same care, and I think that the billing is is the same that way. It takes about the same amount of time. Yeah. Okay, those are the, uh, the there's some questions here about uh, surgeries and those kind of things, but uh, Dr. Riley is going to... That's for the other that. Eric. <laughs> That's yes. the other Eric. Hey, so Dr. Coons, hey, thank you so much. It's been fun to have you chat with us. Yeah. And um, if any other questions come in, we'll send them your way and have us answer online, okay? Well, thanks for letting me be a part of it. Yeah, yeah. thank you, thank you. All right. All right, Dr. Riley, come on down. Hey there. Hello, how Looking are you? Looking sharp today, man. Bow tie Thursday, but I can't pull it off. I'm sorry. All no right. bow ties for me. <laughs> so this is Dr. Eric Riley. Eric is the department chair for, um, for our surgical department. And uh, yeah, so all things surgical flow through Dr. Riley, otherwise known as Eric for the rest of our conversation. <laughs> And uh, I have a list of questions that I wanted to kind of run by him. And as your questions come up, we'll try our best to answer those as well. So I think the first thing I wanted to, to ask you, Eric, what's the status of elective surgery here at CGH? And when I say elective, you, could you kind of explain what that is? Sure. Um, as of right now, all I mean, surgical department is active a, as we speak in terms of dealing with urgent and emergent cases. And an elective case would be um, something of which um, could be postponed without ill harm to the patient. Um, uh, for example, in my world, I'm a foot and ankle surgeon, and, and so someone who has a, a deformity in the front part of their foot, um, say a bunion, for example, uh, that could be uh, put off um, and uh, effectively indefinitely because it's not life or limb threatening. And so those cases in particular um, and or um, say a carpal tunnel for orthopedics um, or a total joint, for example, a total knee um, arthroplasty or a total hip, um, those types of procedures are going to be uh, starting to come back and available. And we're excited about that. Um, we got guidance from the Illinois Department of Public Health um, and that came, I believe, on a weekend. And, and once we got wind of that, um, as you may or may not know, surgeons are, uh, we love to, to work. Uh, we love uh, for the chance to cut. Uh, a chance to cut is a chance to cure, so to speak. And, uh, and with that in mind, we're, we're really excited to get back to work. And, and that should happen, or not should, it is going to happen on uh, May 11th. Okay, yeah. So, and it, it kind of along with that, um, we, we, I talked a little bit with Eric uh, Coons about this, so t can you talk a little bit about uh, the, what we have in place in terms of making sure that patients are safe when they come here to have their surgery at the hospital? Um, sure. Um, safety, uh, I would say pretty much at any hospital, but at our hospital in particular, I have to uh, just commend our organization. I mean, we're a patient-centered organization. Our patients come first in everything that we do. And at the forefront of that comes safety. And so I, I would say that pre-pandemic, um, the safety of, of our organization is, is exceptional, and it's even more so now, uh, taking the extra measures uh, to um, account for uh, COVID. Um, with that in mind, um, uh, the IDPH has put forth guidelines uh, to mandate that all elective procedures uh, will be tested for coronavirus. Um, so any patient, regardless of procedure, um, is going to be tested uh, for coronavirus, and that, that includes anyone. Uh, so yeah. uh, cataracts, bunions, carpals, totals. That the time frame is? Oh, the time frame on that is 72 hours prior to your projected procedure. Um, we're hoping, and, and the time frame for tests coming back um, have been very, very good. We've been getting those back within that 72-hour mark. Um, if for some reason we had someone fall out and we did not know, um, we appreciate certainly the um, patients on behalf of the provider as well as the, the uh, patient that there may be some wiggle room in that day uh, where we may have to move that patient from a morning procedure, say, to an afternoon procedure. Um, but the, you know, all the buildup and, and the preparation that it takes to get a patient ready for surgery uh, we're certainly going to try our best to get that patient done on the day of which it was scheduled. Yeah. Now, and our turnaround times right now have been... Um, Excellent. Yeah, they've been good enough that I, I think we're going to be okay with that, that 72-hour window. Um, 
there's also some uh, in that there are also there's expectations for the patient in terms of quarantine can you speak to that sure along the uh, once uh, the test is done um, three days uh, we're awaiting your uh, test results uh, the recommendations are that you would be self quarantined in your home uh, in such not to have any further exposure yeah that way when you show up if you're negative you're negative and we don't have as Correct. much to yeah I think that makes sense so the, the day that they show up for their surgery can you kind of talk walk through that process for patients from the time they hit the door and what happens there Sure. Similar to what's happening just housewide, um, we still are on uh, visitor restrictions, and it, it is, again, very weird uh, environment to be in healthcare as um, we are very compassionate and empathetic individuals, and, um, and the team approach and family is so very, very important. And at a time, especially when you're having surgery, it, it always humbles me as a surgeon, um, whereby patients effectively release ultimate control when they come into our facility and we take them by um, you know good hands and take care of them throughout the the whole process and family is so very important in that process but we, we just can't have the family present at this time um, with that in mind uh, the patients would be dropped off um, uh, they would go through a process of admitting uh, prior to entering into the building of course they would be screened uh, similarly to a patient encounter in the outpatient clinic um, and from then that process uh, of entering in the building and admission taken back up to our ambulatory surgery unit um, and getting prepared for surgery. I think we're trying to do as much pre-registering as possible. Uh, I don't know that yes. everyone is getting pre-registered, but we're trying to, to avoid minimi that. minimize that time through registration as best we can. I know in registration we have um, some partitions up for the as you do have interact with the uh, people that register you. So that's a, a thing in place too. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then definitely up when you go up to check in what we call uh, ASU or ambulatory you know, the surgery kind of the before you're going to go back to the OR can you talk to what's in place for that with the patients in regards to uh, can you be more specific just like the masking and all those kind of things oh sure um, well uh, I, I, I just assumed that because once you enter into the building of course um, you'll have a mask on um, and uh, of course our staff you'll see our staff following the same thing in regards to universal masking um, and so um, as to protect others not so much as protecting yeah. yourself from yeah. uh, contraction and the nice thing about the elective procedures is that we know you're negative right when you're coming in so it's a, a you know it's a different animal than someone who walks into the emergency department and we're still trying to figure that out correct correct yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, for so no, for the what's your what are you getting on your office side of things, in terms of the response to patients when you because right now we're not on a full surgical schedule. Correct. I can speak to that a little bit more. I, again, I, I commend uh, both patients as well as uh, providers in the sense that everybody has been exceptionally patient uh, and yeah. flexible through this whole process. And I know when the process started weeks ago. Um, uh, you know, we, I don't know that any of us really thought we'd still be here today. And uh, here we are and, and our lives have been uprooted and changed. And, and especially when we think about elective procedures, um, you, you think about the quality of life of these individuals of which has been altered. If you take someone, for example, with a total knee, uh, completely incapacitating and inability to walk, for example, um, and how that affects their quality of life or a cataract, for example, in their um, and their visual acuity is down and they, they, they can't uh, see well and, and what implications that would have to their quality of life or just frankly their safety in their own home. Uh, so being able to do these now is, is, is great. Um, however, uh, some continued flexibility is going to be needed um, and that's, that's really difficult. Um, throughout this whole process, um, we've had a backlog of cases because we have busy uh, a lot. We have a large surgical volume that comes here through CGH, which we're very blessed, and uh, so we have a backlog of cases, of course. Yeah. And uh, we're going to do our best to try and work through that backlog to the best of our ability, but yet in a very safe and efficient and effective manner in terms of ramping up the operating room in a, in a uh, slower yeah. environment. So part of the part of what the state is, has kind of guidance-wise has said, we need to have. Um, the right amount we before you you have to kind of titrate your elective procedures based upon the amount of testing you have available the amount of PPE that you have available and even the number of hospital beds that you have available 
Can you, can you speak to that a little bit about what, what where we're at with that stuff? Sure. Since learning of this, again, uh, we've been hard at work, the leadership has, in terms of meeting um, frequently to try and develop up a plan that would um, address these elective procedures and getting uh, as many done as possible. But um, again, it's all resource dependent. And Dr. Bird mentioned the resources um, of which are bed capacity, ventilator capacity. Uh, testing is probably the, the it is the uh, limiting factor at the, the rate, moment. At yeah, the at moment. The moment. Um, <laughs> Next and and that could change <laughs> because it could flip and, and we could have a surge of patients and it could be bed capacity or, for example, personal protective equipment, otherwise known as uh, uh, PPE. So uh, we have to be you know, flexible to these changes and, and change accordingly. Um, we've we've um, allowed uh, a very fair and equitable way to um, address some of the elective procedures in such that um, all will be allowed to schedule cases. Um, unfortunately, it's just uh, at a much slower rate. Um, and that rate will change uh, all dependent upon the resources available that we have here. We anticipate that uh, based upon uh, the history that we've had, um, and what we forecast that we'll be hopefully changing into our phases, we hope on a, on a every two week cycle. Yeah. Would be my guess. Yeah, yeah. So probably the month of May, what, do you, what are you thinking for the month of May in terms of, are, are we gonna be? Well, I can speak, speak specifically to the numbers that we have available to us at this time, if yeah, you'd like. Yeah. Um, as far as uh, May 11th, um, the operating room will be doing 25 um, procedures. Um, in addition to in addition that's in addition to any emergent or urgent case um, uh, where whereby and again when we speak to that it doesn't necessarily mean uh, emergency only uh, we, we qualify urgency as as being something as though that the patient's quality of life and or uh, the the consequence rather uh, is going to be detrimental um, if we put that off and so those cases will still continue to be going on yeah, good. Um, yeah, so like in terms of your perspective, in terms of this, are, is this a, a safe spot right now if, if you needed to have elective surgery? How do you feel about that? Well, I, um, my wife gives me a hard time at home because she uh, always says this is not the operating room. So yeah. um, with that in mind, uh, the <laughs> operating room in my world is probably the, the, the best location you should be or could be and probably if not the just, most safe just environment. Just hang out there. If just hang, hang out, out there. The yeah. <laughs> if you just hang out in the OR, you're going to be, you're going to be good for many reasons. Um, yeah, I think um, even and this goes, you know, pre-pandemic, um, you know, but uh, there were some little logistical things that were done as well yeah. uh, during this whole cycle as well in terms of things uh, that were changed. But absolutely, this is uh, the operating room is one of the safest places um, in in our organization. You know, um, and speaking of like rate limiting things in terms of doing this stuff, it's just so interesting as this is, this like for the last eight weeks, it's it's been uh, the word PPE, I don't know how many times I've said that, <laughs> how many times I've said uh, testing supplies and all those kind of things. It's just, it's, um, yeah, it's just an ongoing balancing act of trying to get that all in place. And then, and believe, believe you me, we all want to, do what we, what we can to help people that have knees that need to be, to be replaced, bunions that need to be fixed, gallbladders that need to come out, you know, all these kind of things that um, we so much want to help out the folks with, with those kind of things. Well, and in this, we haven't seen a huge surge of surgical volume as it relates to the consequences of COVID, uh, which, um, you know, as a surgeon could be considered good or bad. Um, but nonetheless, um, I can assure you that every surgeon here at CGH, there is a lot of pent up energy ready to take care of folks. Um, we just want to get back to doing the things we love. Yeah. And uh, we're excited to be able to start to do that. Yeah. Um, and, and we're looking forward to May 11th. You know, I've always appreciated about our, um, our hospital and our, and our surgical uh, uh, department is when folks go through the process of having whatever procedure done, I'm, there are exceptions to this, but by and large, um, they are just struck by what it's like to have community members take care of community members and the quality of the care, the care that the, the people have for um, take, the people that are taking care of our patients 
um, I feel really good, man. If I needed to have, you know, if I needed to have a bunion done, man, I'd do it here in a heartbeat. And I'm not saying oh, thanks, that just. <laughs> I, appreciate I don't that. think I have one, <laughs> but in a heartbeat. Um, I just think our, our, our surgeons and our surgical nursing staff and everyone that's part of that, um, x ray techs and everyone, does do such a great job uh, taking care of patients. So I, I feel really good about that. I certainly echo that. I can only speak from my, uh, again, uh, through personal experience and, and some of the things that you hear from your patients. But um, oftentimes, uh, uh, patients will gravitate towards going to a different experience. And, and inevitably, what I hear when they come back is that they wish they would have never left. And, and this is coming from referrals that I may have sent to a tertiary center. And they come back and they say, boy, I have more faith in our organization and you and our hospital here that uh, we're going to keep our care here. And and that and through personal experience as well. I mean, the quality of care that we have here to offer um, and, and the manner of which the care is given, um, you, you, you don't get that um, outside of our community. And, and a shout out as far as that care goes on the nursing side of things to the, to the nurses who are listening. This happy Nurses happy Week, by nurses the way. Week. Yes, 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 yes. They get a week, we get a day. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, it's Which is okay. Right. It's yeah, okay. It's, it's good. That's I mean, good. We, we know who runs, <laughs> we know who steers this ship, you know, right? You know, yeah. um, nurses run the world. So that's good. We give them a week. Yeah. Um, all right. So let me see what, uh, did I, was there something else I, you thought I was going to ask you that I didn't get around to? I'm certainly not prepared for it, Bill. So I don't, <laughs> um, yeah. So no. Um, <laughs> No, I don't think so. Well, let's right. get to some questions. All right, let's see if we got anything here. Uh, let's see. Well, the first is a comment. It's Dr. Riley is awesome. So how about that? Thank you, family. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> Dana, seriously, these, these are like, my, I don't have my readers on. Some of these you sent me are like, oh, my gosh. Let's see here. Uh, you want to... Uh, th there's there's some readers being offered here. Uh, Would you like uh, some? I'm okay. Uh, okay. I, I had the I made it bigger here. Okay. Um, this is more uh, just to, I will throw it out. Um, let's see. Is it true that wearing a mask in public that really doesn't protect as much as if you were to come in contact with COVID? For instance, if a person goes shopping and leaves the store and takes off their mask with their hands, otherwise if they are taking their mask off and on throughout the day, are they actually protected? Fair question. What would you say about that? Well, boy, there's a lot of controversy around, uh, uh, around masking. And, you know, I see masking as, as having two functions. One, either uh, protection for yourself um, in a situation and or protection for others. Um, in this particular case, and I think where we're at with this, and, and, and Dr. Uh, uh, Bird or, or Dr. Coons could certainly speak up to this, I think we're in a situation where um, we're simply trying to protect others. Uh, and, um, and, and in that, um, you can get into trouble uh, with inappropriate masking. Uh, there, there is uh, certainly uh, a right way, and there's a wrong way. Uh, there's, you know, no sloppy way. I, uh, out in the community, um, and and seeing things such as, uh, you know, rubber bands holding um, uh, napkins on, for example, masks down um, here. Yeah, or mask on your chins, or. <laughs> You know, Not the, good. yeah, or constantly touching your mask and then getting into your vehicle and getting on your steering wheel and driving home uh, without hand sanitization. I mean, there's yeah. certainly uh, a right way and a wrong way. So, just in general, uh, good question. And and the questioner is is onto something here. If you don't wear a mask right, you're not going to get as much benefit from it. And and I, their time will tell in terms of. Um, the cloth masking in terms of how much particulate matter from someone else who has an infection we're preventing. But I, I'd encourage for now, I think it makes sense. Um, I do think there's going to be some benefit we're going to find. Is it as good as a, 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 an N95? Of course not. Um, I would encourage you to do it. One thing I would say from a practical standpoint, like when I, uh, I went to Walmart yesterday to, to get grab something, just keep this in mind, you know, it, the, the front of that mask is is the part that you are exposing to the world so it's the part that you don't want to be grabbing and touching a whole lot so before i go in the walmart i have a little bit of hand sanitizer put a little dab on my hand rub, rub it on my hand grab grab the mask uh, by the little straps uh, put it on me adjust it and before i walk in a little more hand sanitizer and off i go and the whole time i'm at walmart i'm very conscious about the fact that i'm not reaching up here I'm not touching my mask. I'm not doing anything with it. 
I'm just going about my business and not going. I'm not going above the neck, um, other than the reach up if I need something, right? But otherwise, not doing that. And then when I get back to the car, a uh, little bit of hand sanitizer. Use those straps. Take the mask off. Set it down uh, somewhere in the car, ideally on a like um, a cloth or you know napkin or something like that. But if you can't do that, then at least put it somewhere not where a lot of folks aren't at and put it um, face down on the thing and then put a little more hand sanitizer. If you do that, um, you get more bang from your buck and more more help from that that cloth mask. Um, let's see here. Um, this is one that comes from Julie Robbins. Thanks, Julie. Uh, will all docs keep offering the telehealth option? Um, I, I can't speak for all docs. Um, I can say. <laughs> Come on now. Yeah. yeah I, the department chair. I see you're still to. over here. You yeah. Can, Speak for that. Um, it, it has been nice. I think it's opened up an opportunity for us certainly to deliver care. Um, it, it certainly isn't the um, uh, thing that we're all used to, both provider as well as patient, um, but it does give us um, an opportunity to, uh, to see uh, folks, which is great. Um, it's strictly um, based upon the guidelines from what will be allowed. Um, oftentimes, unfortunately, in medicine, we're told what we can and can't do. Um, and if we're told that we can continue to do telehealth, I can assure you CGH will still offer telehealth. Whether all providers will do it or not, that would be up to the specific provider, um, but I can tell you it, it, it is a absolute nice opportunity. I've, I've treated patients now in their work, I've mm -hmm. treated them gardening, <laughs> I've treated them uh, you know, in their homes, and yeah. uh, it, it's, it's a nice opportunity. So I don't see that going away anytime soon. Yeah, I think the thing about the telehealth, just to be upfront about it too, was in the past, the, the um, we would do the visit, but the government wasn't real good about, our insurers weren't real good about paying for it either. And right. now I think there's momentum. They're seeing that, hey, you know, this this does seem to be helpful for patients. I, I, I think that the sense I get, Eric's still in the room, I get the sense that that's gonna probably be um, something that is gonna be still supported by insurance. So that also, I think, will make that continue to be relevant. So I, I do think that, my guess is that the vast majority of our folks will continue to have some sort of telehealth uh, presence in terms of seeing patients. Um, let's see here. Okay, I'm going to ask one of our surgeons a medical question, and so we'll see how, he, how oh, he does it. Oh, Okay. So there's a fracture. I'm going <laughs> to fix it. <laughs> I must fix it. This is from Sean Brewer. How can you tell the difference between chest muscle pain and pneumonia chest pain? But, oh, really? Yeah, really. Really? Go back to okay. medical school, man. Let's um, see if you can pull it in there. A funny joke about that. I have a colleague who's kind of in a similar boat, and uh, it would be um, that first you would have to um, break the glass to find out because it's housed within his stethoscope is housed within a uh, glass enclosure that that's in, in, inscribed "break in case of emergency." Um, so first we'd break the glass, uh, yeah, and yeah, we'd it. probably put that uh, the things in our ears and, and our stethoscope to listen to the patient. Um, but the question is, how how can you tell the difference in terms of yeah uh, a pneumonia you know, versus yeah. versus like chest wall pain or something? Chest like wall pain. Well, um, I would say that it, it depends upon your breathing, really. If there's if there's pain with exertion uh, or versus inspiration and things like that you could somewhat differentiate probably between the two. Um, anytime you're having difficulty breathing in particular, um, you, you should get it checked out in regards to a respiratory uh, illness, especially in today's climate of COVID. Uh, chest wall strains and things like that typically present uh, with a little bit more musculoskeletal pain yeah. um, and um, you're not gonna have that difficulty breathing and things like that. All right. Is that fair? That's a good, that's Fair, I'm gonna add a little something to that because okay, I'm more on the medicine side of things. <laughs> please do. <laughs> so, Dr. Riley's on the right track too with, you know, you have other symptoms too. So, you might have fever, you might have some chest wall pain, you're typically not gonna have ongoing shortness of breath, um, you're not gonna have sweats, you're not gonna have all these other things that you can some, oftentimes we get on the COVID side of things. So, if it just kind of stays in your chest and that's the only thing you have and it kind of hurts when you take a breath in, usually that's more of what we call costochondritis. Um, and that's not typically pneumonia. So there's more that goes with pneumonia than just having pain in your chest. Fair? Yeah, and you know, if you push on it uh, and it hurts, then it's probably what you're pushing on and don't do that. You <laughs> catch that? Right. Okay, so, did they catch that? Okay, yeah, well, yeah, I'll just repeat what Dr. Kuhn said too, yeah. So if you can push on it and it hurts, it's probably not pneumonia. So that's another way to look at that. 
Here's a uh, here's one that um, I'm gonna. I think Dr. Riley would feel more comfortable with. <laughs> so, uh, are the patients recovering from surgery on the same unit as the COVID patients? Uh, the answer to that question, as we speak right now, is no, absolutely not. Um, and uh, when we speak of recovering patients, I think we have to be specific in terms of outpatient versus inpatients. Um, and um, in our outpatient setting, uh, we obviously, uh, those patients uh, uh, will be elective. We're gonna know that those patients are negative um, and they would go um, into the um, uh, PACU and or back to their, directly to their ambulatory surgery unit room uh, and then uh, going home from there. Um, but in recovery, um, all patients uh, of known positive patients um, are certainly handled in a very different manner um, and kept separate from that of um, negative patients. Yeah, so they're on a separate floor uh, than the COVID patients. And we're actually making a transition um, between now and next week. And um, the, the, um, the surgical floor um, is going to be the surgical floor again. And we're doing. I can. I, I can list. It's, it's. We're doing all the things that. It is. So in the surgical floor, everything's gonna be just fine, in terms of being safe for patients. And then we'll have our patients who are uh, COVID or COVID suspect patients. Um, we have enough negative pressure rooms that we'll put them in those. Um, so yeah, we have a plan in place for that. So yeah, if you're having surgery, you're not going to be on the same floor. Uh, let's just say you're not going to be, the surgical floor is going to be the surgical floor and you're going to be not around uh, COVID patients when you go get taken care of. Uh, yeah, got a plan in place for that. Uh, what else do we have here? Okay, so this is um, from someone just kind of follow up on the uh, going to the store and all that kind of stuff with your masking and everything. Uh, okay, what about your protection doesn't put risk if you are touching things at the store and go to take your mask off and everyone has hand sanitizer. My mask is kind of big, so I'm always pulling it up. Yeah, that's a, there's a lot packed into that statement and. Um, I guess on the hand sanitizer side, um, gosh, um, I, I would, yeah, if you don't have the hand sanitizer, I guess what I would, I would do, okay, and I can take this, we got this. Um, <laughs> when I was at my house, um, I would wash my hands very thoroughly in my sink, and then I would put on my mask. And if my straps weren't quite working the way they should, I'd get that all figured out at my house. Maybe that if, you're, if your uh, mask is big and the straps seem kind of, then maybe tie them up a little bit so when you put them on, the mask is a little tighter. Get that figured out at your house. Uh, wash my hands, put the mask on, and go do your whatever you're gonna do. Leave it on, don't touch it. You get home, um, wash your hands, then take your mask, take it off, put it someplace like a Tupperware Container or something like that with the face down, and then rewash your hands. I think that's how I would go about doing it. I, I'm sure there's more nuances to whoever the question is here than that, but that would just be my. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah, I would just add one thing, and that is just remember: any time that uh, you're you're touching your mask, you're contaminated, and so you have to wash your hands. And and whether that be wash your hands or hand sanitize. In addition, as you take your mask off um, and you place it down. Whatever your match, your mask touched is now contaminated, and so uh, just remember to go ahead and, and uh, sanitize that area as well. So not a bad idea to have some Clorox wipes or something in your car or something like that if you are placing the Tupperware in such that when you take that mask out, you can sanitize that Tupperware because um, that is contaminated. So good, good idea. Got a comment from Nikki Roberts, uh, um, just saying. Uh, basically shout out saying hi to us and hi Nikki, hi, Nikki. Nikki works in EBS <laughs> and if I remember right Nikki I think you're going camping um, unfortunately I think it's in your sister's uh, yard or something <laughs> like that so hope that goes we'll have, have fun with that and uh, have a good time off Nikki um, and then I think I have another one here from if I can get my phone to do what I wanted to do oh, come on now I, I saw one shout out from Linda Schlegel hi Linda Thanks for listening. Appreciate it. She's a she's a Morrisonite. 
Uh-huh. Um, let me see what else we have here. Um, what else do you have? Oh, here we go. Now I've got it. Uh, got some else? Oh, White's, okay. So there's a question about Whiteside County Health Department testing. Yeah, so the health department uh, is able to do some testing right now as well. Um, what I guess I would say about that is um, because of, I, I know the health department has said that they'll, I think, basically test anybody that comes there. Um, okay. Um, because of testing shortages, I think my preference would be that it'd still be folks who have more of the symptoms that we're, we test uh, so that we have some sense of if you have symptoms and you're positive. But yeah, the health, health department is do, definitely doing some testing. What I would say to that just from a surgical standpoint is the fact that we have a process in place whereby we know that we're going to be getting our turnaround times back within that 72 hours and um, not deviating from that um, because when we do that we're not guaranteed to have those test results back and it certainly may alter your ability to have your procedure um, so going with our testing would be preferred at least uh, for surgical patients yeah we're going to continue doing that for our surgical patients. oh for sure yeah, i just yeah. not to confuse in terms of right, right. going to a satellite location to get your testing and thinking that that's probably more appropriate um, it's right right um, if you only have a paper mask or you're able to sanitize it, um, oh, okay. I hear that my finger taps are getting picked up. Oh, that's a nice mic. Better than last week's where you couldn't hear me, right? Okay. Um, if you only have a paper mask or you're able to sanitize it, I don't think so. And so um, it's more the cloth or some of these reusable respirator kind of things, but unfortunately, I don't. I think we're gonna add, yeah, that's gonna be a no-go. So uh, the consensus here is no. Um, so yeah, unfortunately that's not gonna be uh, something you can do. So once again, it's, it's all the more important that um, if you're wearing that mask for you know several outings to different stores, that's okay. But that face down and what we talked about, I think is helpful to keep that um, more viable for longer. And Dana's chicken scratching something else down here to see what we have. Okay, so um, anything else we need to talk about, Dr. Riley? I don't think so. I get to go now, I, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> ben, it's been great. Thanks for, thanks for being Absolutely. part of this. It's been great. To, it's been to great. Thank you. I appreciate Thank it. You. I'm going to have Dr. Coons come back. I guess I have, we have another Dr. Coons question. All right, fire away. What do we have right, for Dr. Just don't Coons? ask me any surgical questions, all right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, 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 yeah. <laughs> We'll flip uh, it around here. So, what was the question, Dana? Uh, well, I, I've got okay. one here about okay. uh, there was a question on uh, why COVID nineteen is is very different than than H one N one. Boy, that, that's a question we could spend the entire next hour uh, uh, answering here. So I'm going to try and distill it down very <laughs> in our <laughs> next two minutes. <laughs> right. Very, so it, it's it's very different in its scope. Um, one thing that's not often recognized is the uh, flu deaths are um, that are reported by the CDC are actually extrapolated from sites and there's some math involved and things like that what we're looking at right now for COVID is actually swab proven deaths or there's a doctor that's saying yeah three of them and their family had it we didn't get to test them but that, that that's probably that too so there's a difference in scope COVID is much bigger in scope um, COVID is also a different animal that we're just really learning about that does a lot of other things. It gets into other organs. It tends to cause more blood clots. It has other things that uh, just make it nastier um, and, and, and less predictable um, in general. Flu can be bad, but boy, uh, you know, it's... Um, it is it is a different animal for sure, both in its scope and um, how it presents and how it uh, um, the things it does to you. So I guess that's the, the the quick and dirty of that. And that was well done. Good quick and dirty. <laughs> Appreciate that. All right. Hey, uh, been uh, fun having both Eric's with Bill here, and thank for those of you who have listened live, and for those of you who are going to listen recorded. And hope you have a good rest of your day. Be safe, and we might try to try to do this again next week. Thanks. Bye.